All right, thanks, Gersh. All right, title of the sermon this morning is Our Church Values. Our Church Values. It's something I've been thinking about, um, not necessarily finalized, but I thought it would make a good sermon nonetheless. So I wanted to share uh, my current thoughts with you um, on this topic. So uh, in Philippians 3, I mean, when we talk about our church values, our mission, our vision, I mean, it's about setting a goal, what we're striving for. And, and, and the verse I thought about when uh, thinking of our mission and our vision and our values is in Philippians 3, uh, where Paul is striving for perfection. Not that he can reach it, but he's pressing towards that mark. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. So he's saying, I haven't arrived there, but that's what I'm, that's what I'm, uh, that's what I'm going for. If that I may apprehend for that, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. See, so he's saying, I, I don't think I've arrived, and, and nobody has in this world. We're all sinners striving to be perfect. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So organizations will often define their mission, their vision, and their values to help guide the organization's direction and to, you know, to create a desired culture. And that's something that I've been reflecting on deeply as the bishop of this church and something you know, I was talking about with Christine about when we were talking about uh, with Kids Bible Club and like, how do we encourage the right behaviors? How do we encourage kids to uh, you know, follow in our footsteps? How do we get them to do the activities? And, and really what it comes down to is setting a, a church culture you know, and that, and that really is done by all of us. It's not just me setting a church culture. It's the, the, if you think about now, like what, what creates a culture? It's how people in society behave and what their expectations are and what their standards are. And then you say, well, that's what that culture is like. So it makes, makes me think, how, what can I do as the bishop of this church to try and, in, and encourage and motivate the right type of culture in our church that's going to achieve uh, what we want to achieve, and, and the sort of future that we want to create. So I thought, uh, well, maybe one thing I can do, and what a lot of leaders of organizations do, is try to at least uh, clearly define what those things are. Um, so this is not a finalized list of values, and, and values in an organization uh, can adapt over time because it depends on the state of the culture of any organization um, at any given point in time. But these are the things I think uh, that are on my heart that I think we can focus on and um, that I wanted to share with you today. But first, let's talk about the mission. I wrote this mission statement, and uh, I'll read it to you here. It says, Our mission is the Great Commission to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ by preaching the gospel, baptizing believers, and making disciples through the teaching of God's word. So, this is obviously based on Matthew 28, you know, 18 to 20. You know, uh, I, I won't I'll go over that for sake of time, but we know what the Great Commission is, right? To preach the gospel, baptize believers, and teach God's word, make disciples. So I've just defined that here in these words here. But I added these words on the beginning. Our mission is the Great Commission because I wanted to emphasize the point that we didn't come up with our mission. You know, we didn't make... It's like organizations will make up why they exist and what their purpose is. But we didn't make up our own one. We are given and commanded of it by the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a reminder there that we are given a mission. We don't have to think of one, and we want to make sure we don't have the wrong one either. Because sometimes people's Christianity, it starts being about, oh, you know, just uh, them learning something, or them making friends, or them being part of a community. That's not the ultimate mission, right? Because what is the mission of an organization? It is our purpose. It's, what, it's everything we do should con contribute towards this goal. And it's a reminder here that we didn't come up with this. You know, Jesus told us that this is what our mission should be. So when we live our life, it should be centered around this mission. Why, why do we do anything in our life? You say, well, uh, you know, why do I exist? Well, you exist to fulfill the Great Commission, to preach the gospel, baptize believers, and make disciples through the teaching of God's word. You say, well, why do I work? Well, I work to make money so that I can survive and I can exist to 
serve God and glorify Him by preaching the gospel, baptizing believers, making disciples through the teaching of God's Word. You know, why do I get married? Why do I have children? Well, it's so I can raise godly children and glorify God by fulfilling the Great Commission. So it all comes back to that mission. And, you know, we say that, what's, why do we, what does the mission solve? Well, it glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. What about a vision? What is, what is a vision? So the vision is what the future looks like if we are successful in our mission. Right? If we are fulfilling our mission, what sort of future do we want to create? So I've worded this vision statement because when I think about hey, what I would like our church to achieve, this is what I have always envisioned. And even on the website, I, I wrote something there as well, which is loosely sort of based, or this was loosely based on that. So it says here, a growing community of Bible-believing Christians who are passionate about the Great Commission and have a godly impact in the local area. So just, just to break that down. So what is the vision? Like I said, when you think, what, do, what is the future state? You know, if we are a thriving church fulfilling our mission, what does the future of this community look like? And this is what I would like it to look like. Uh, it's my thoughts right now. So one is, when, all, when organizations write these statements, they're very specific in the words that they've chosen. So this, I was very specific in the words I chose as well. So it's a growing community. Why? Because we are always growing. We never stop growing. We're always reaching new people. That's why it's a growing community. It's not just a community that just stagnates. And sometimes communities that stagnate, they just start dying, don't they? So you want to always be growing, whether it's physically, by having many children, or by reaching new people, right? And having new people come into the community. So we're always growing. We never arrive. We never have enough people. You know, we don't want to have an attitude where we form these cliques and it's like, oh, you know, we're just fine with the people that we know. No, we always want to reach more. We always want to bring more people into the fold. We're always reaching more. And we're a community. What does a community mean? Because we love and we care for one another. We, we take a genuine interest in others' lives. Sometimes it hurts me when I talk to people in church and they don't know other people in church or they don't know like somebody's prayer request that's been on there for years and years and years. It's like you've got to know each other. You've got to care about one another. Treat each other like a family, like community. Right? So we take a genuine interest in other people's lives and we realize how our actions can impact others, right? That's part of being a community too. That if you start living in sin, you start backsliding, that's going to have an impact on other people. So that's very important as well. Bible believing, right? We don't just live based on vain traditions or ignorant traditions. We know what we believe, why we believe it. You know, it's based on God's word, not on man's tradition. Bible believing Christians who are passionate about the Great Commission, so it's not that just we're just doing the Great Commissions and just going through the motions, but we're actually passionate about it, right? We're zealous. We're not just in autopilot mode. Right? It gets to that. You know, we've all been there. We've all been there in our Christianity where it's like, you know, at first it's like exciting and everything like that, but then you, then you get to a stage in your Christianity where it's like autopilot mode, where it's just like you can just coast on the things you know. You're no longer growing, no longer passionate about the things of God. No, we need to be passionate about the Great Commission, passionate about the things of God, and have a godly impact in the local area. So what is that alluding to? We want to make our mark in this local area, right, in which we live. We want to impact the society here. We don't want to treat our community like a closed community. Oh, you know, we got our beliefs, but we're just separating from the world. This is why I don't, I don't agree with this whole like off-grid living where people just like want to live in the outback and just separate from society because you are called to be salt and light in this world. You're not called to just like live apart from society where nobody knows you exist. So our goal is to actually impact the local area. We need to be part of this society here and impact it. We're not going to impact it if we completely just like separate off grid and we, nobody knows we exist. So we want to have an impact in the local area, but we don't want to just have any impact, right? We want to have a godly impact. 
Because, you know, there's some churches where, you know, maybe they do a lot of social good in the area. But the church is full of a bunch of worldly people that are conformed to this world. There's no difference between the people in that church and the people in the world. So we want to have a positive impact. If we can participate in charitable things, great. But ultimately, we want to have a godly impact in the area. We want to start lifting the standards of, of the area and create that culture. So that's the mission and the vision. What about values? So that's what I want to talk about today. So seven values. So how do values differ from the mission, which is the purpose? The vision is the future state. So when you think about what, what is it going to be like in 20 years' time, 30 years' time, that's what we imagine. What are the values? The values are how we need to live the sort of people we need to be to create that culture, to, to arrive at that vision. So what culture do we need to create in order to fulfill the mission and achieve the vision? And that's what I want to talk about today. So seven values that I would like uh, you know, our, our church to emulate. The first one, and this is where it, it all has to start, it all has to start with a love for the Lord. A love for the Lord. It's the first and greatest commandment. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So we love God with all our heart with all our soul, with all thy mind. And the way I think of these is, you know, your heart is, you know, emotionally. When we talk about being passionate about the things of God, it's like loving God with all your heart and zeal. With all thy soul, I think about when you love God with all your soul, it's like who you are. You know, your soul is your identity. So it's, it's like identifying with God and wanting to stand with God, not being ashamed of the things of God. You know, do you, do you stand boldly and, uh, you know, love God with all your soul? And with all thy mind, meaning, you know, we don't want to be a Christian that just, you know, loves God with all our heart, but has no idea what they believe, has no idea about the things of God, you know, is very ignorant about the truths of God, but they love God so much, right? So we need to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, the question is, like, how do we develop that love? Well, one thing, one way we develop that love for God is we need to appreciate the things that God has done for us. And the greatest thing he's done for us is he has provided salvation. 2 Corinthians 5, what Paul writes here, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So one reason why you want to love God is because God loved you enough to come and die for your sins, rise again, give you eternal life. See, in 1 John 4.19, the Bible tells us we love him because he first loved us. You see, a love for God is a response to what God does for you. It's not something that you just muster up out of your own effort. If you reflect on the things that God does for you and has done for you and will do for you, you may be more thankful of the things that he has done for you. And in response, you might want to, you know, do your reasonable service. We love him because he first loved us. So he provides us with salvation, with our family, with our health. There's so many things to be thankful for that we take for granted. But if we sometimes stop and reflect on how good we have life and, you know, the things that we enjoy, the health that we enjoy, the fact that we can see and walk and eat and we have, you know, we live in a free country, you know, we can be more appreciative of the things that God does for us and then it'll grow your love for God because you'll be thankful for the things he does for you. Psalm 136, 1, I give thanks unto the Lord for he is good for his mercy endureth forever. So a love for God, like I said, is not just a, a mushy feeling, right? <laughs> Whereas, you know, that is part of it. Love, part of love is the emotional side of it. But that's not all love is. Love is also an action, 
Right? We show we love God by keeping his commandments. But one way we also love God is that we love his word. You know, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So when you ask yourself the question, do I love the Lord? Well, what is your relationship like with his word? You say, well, I love the Lord, but I never read his word. Or do you really love the Lord? Because the Bible says the word was with God and the word was God. You see, it's the same with the body of Christ. You say you love God, but do you love coming to church? Do you love being with God's people? Do you love serving God's people? Because that's a reflection of how much you love God. If you say you love God, but then you don't love reading God's word, you need to ask yourself, do I really love God? Right? So we need to re reflect on these things because we want to grow in our love for God. We want to make sure we actually love God, that we don't just love in word, but we love in deed. Right? We actually love God, love his word, love his body, right? and love his people. That's how we love God. Now, part of loving God is not just the positive, right? So when we love what is right, part of loving what is right is also hating what is false, right? So hating is not a sin. It is, some, it is right to hate certain things. Psalm 119, 128, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. So when we talk about loving the Lord, it's not just only the positive. Right? We need to love that which is good, but we also need to hate that which is evil. And there's a lot of evil going on in the world now, especially with the whole transgender movement. Right? Transgender is just pushing it on our kids and pushing it in the schools. And it's one thing I've been thinking about, and because I, I watch a lot of, um, you know, Mark Dice. I find Mark Dice very funny when he does his uh, his commentary. And uh, all these companies that are going woke. What I don't understand, it's like, it's like the agenda is so strong to push the LGBT agenda that companies don't even care that they're losing money. You know, what was it? Bud Light had a transgender person, you know, as their spokesperson, and then they lost, like, money. And then now Harley Davidson, I think, there was a recent one that, that partnered up with Bud Light, and now... Do you think all the, the gangs are going to be happy that they're partnering up with Bud Light? I don't know. I mean, I don't know any of these things, and I don't drink beer either. But the thing is, why is the, why is the world so zealous about their agenda? You know, they're, they're willing to push their agenda and lose money. I, I, sometimes I wonder, are Christians that bold? Are Christians willing to take a stand? Are Christians willing to do that? Man, the, the, the left and the homosexual agenda, they're willing to do that. And them, that's not even a, that's like their religion. It's just not even a religion. And they're more bold in that than those that have the truth. I just uh, find that a sad thing. Well, there's a lot of things to hate in this world, a lot of crazy things that are going on. But my point is, you know, loving God is, is, is a balance, right? It's not only positive. When we love, so if you love children, you'll hate abortion. If you love the truth, you're going to hate lies. And we need to have a, a good, righteous dose of both. Number two, number two, Valley, so we need to love the Lord. Number two is we need to have a burden for the lost. A burden for the lost. So we know the Great Commissions preach the gospel, baptize believers teach believers the word of God. Everybody needs to be contributing to the Great Commission. Everyone should be a soul winner. My question to you is, do you have a desire to see people saved? So that's why this is more than just, are you soul winning? Are you preaching the gospel? This value is about, do you have a burden for the lost? You know, do you have a desire to see people saved? You know, are you uncomfortable with people not being saved? Like, do you go about your day just thinking, well, I'm saved, I'm sweet? Or do you, do you have a burden for the lost and you think, you know what, I'm saved, but there's so many people that aren't saved. What am I doing about it? That burden is going to drive you to get involved. So you're going to go soul winning because, oh, Victor's bugging me. And Victor's bugging me every week. I'll just go soul winning so Victor stops bugging me, right? That's not the right value, right? The value is, do you have a burden for the lost? Do you care that people are not saved? Because if you care that people are not saved, 
then you'll be encouraging other people to go soul winning, right? And you'll join me in this cause and this mission to try and encourage people to go soul winning. So do you have a burden for the lost? Are you going to be like Isaiah in Isaiah 6, 8? It says, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. See, Isaiah answered the call. 1 Corinthians 9. I want to share a couple of verses with you that sort of emphasize this value. Look at Paul's attitude here to preaching the gospel. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. See, am I, am I a great... Is it something for me to boast about because I go soloing? No, he says, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. You see the burden there? Or is he saying he's uncomfortable with not doing it, right? It's not that he thinks he's done some great thing because he's done it, right? It's a burden that he's not doing it. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Look at this verse in Jeremiah. I love this one. This is often you know, talk, used as a passage to talk about that, that, that burning desire to want to preach God's word and not be able to keep it in. Jeremiah 20. This is when Jeremiah is going under a lot of persecution and he's kind of a bit upset at God because he's saying, you know, he was, he was told to be a preacher but now life is so hard, right? So he's sort of saying to God here, not with the right attitude, that God's kind of deceived him into this, into this life. O oh Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. So he's reflecting on the, the hard life he has as a, as a preacher of God's word, because he's under persecution. Look at what he says here in verse 9. Then I said, so he's like done, right? He's like, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But... His word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing. So he couldn't hold back. He had that burden to preach God's word. He had that burden to reach people. It says, I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. A burden for the lost. A burden to preach God's word. Is that what we have? Romans 9.1. This is the, this I think epitomizes having a burden for the lost. Look at what Paul says here in Romans 9. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That's, that's in effect somebody saying, I put my hand on my heart, I swear I'm telling the truth. This is what he's saying here. This is how he feels inside. That I have a great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So you see Paul's burden here, that he had such a burden for the lost, that he wished to God that if he could go to hell for his brethren, if, that, if him going to hell meant that people could be saved, he was willing to do that. So Paul is willing to go to hell. We won't even spend a Sunday going soul winning. Like, you know, when it's too cold out, we don't go soul winning. When it's too hot out, we have all sorts of reasons. But Paul's burden was, hey, he was willing to suffer the eternal fires of hell if that meant he could get some people saved. That was his attitude. That's the, that's the attitude that we want. Now, is that possible? It's not possible. But that's the value we want to have is we want that burden for the lost where we, where it's, where it doesn't sit right with us. You know, it shouldn't sit right with you that you're not participating in the Great Commission. And that's the sort of value we want. Number three. So number two was a burden for the lost. Number three is we need to work diligently. Work diligently. So Matthew 25, we'll go to the parable of the talents quickly. But we'll just uh, read the last bit because I just want to emphasize this point here. So when we talk about work diligently, the idea here is, one is work. We need to be workers. We need to be hard workers. And then diligently is about 
the standards at which we work. Because you know, we can work hard, but we want to work to a high standard as well. Matthew 25, 19 says here, After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. So what I like about this parable, and we know that I'm not going over the parable in depth. We know that he gave talents to these different servants and he went away, came back to see what they had achieved. So we can see here, after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. So what's this, this idea of faithfulness? It's, like, it's this idea of reliability. It's this idea of taking initiative, that you don't need to be supervised all the time, that, you're, that the God here... The master can go away and then you go about the activity uh, uh, diligently. And so that he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents, but all I have gained beside them five talents more. Right? So this is great here. Productive. Right? Five talents. He's doubled his amount of talents for the Lord. And like everyone is given talents. So talent in the Bible is you know, a, a weight but, you know, when we think of what the talents represent, it can represent a lot of things, like your skills and abilities, your resources that you have. What are you doing with them to further God's kingdom and fulfill that great commission that we talked about in the beginning? His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So it's not just about working and the effort you put in. So working hard, being reliable, being faithful, but doing things to a high standard as well. So, you know, doing things that even may not be so important, but doing them well, doing them for the glory of God. Because if you're faithful in that which is least, the Bible says, you'll be faithful also in much. Luke 16, 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches. Right? So it's not just about working hard. Yes, we work hard, but we want to lift our standards as well. When we do work for God, let's do our best. Let's give our best. Let's try our best. Let's always do better. Right? This is what it means. So when we work, we want to work diligently as well. And, you know, we have different tasks, but, you know, even if you're doing a least task, like the Bible says, be faithful in that, and then you'll be faithful also in much. You say here, well, you know, Victor, you're just like, standards just too high and all these sorts of things. Look at this. This is 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Yeah, maybe you're right, I have some perfectionist tendencies. Maybe my, I'm a little more picky than other people. But I like to think that I am trying to follow this verse, right? That even the most mundane things as eating and drinking, we do it to the glory of God. I want to do it to the best of my ability, right? So this is about having high standards. We want to work diligently. That, therefore, the work that we do is of a higher standard. All right, let's go on to number four. Number four is we serve with joy. Serve with joy. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. What is this mind? A mind of a servant, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So we want to be like Jesus Christ. We want to be a servant and we want to have the mind of a servant to want to serve, right? So we need to serve the body, so that we edify the body. I want to read you this passage here in 1 Corinthians 12, that the church is a body, like we talked about in Ephesians 4 last time, where every joint contributes to this body. We are a body, and every member in this body has a purpose, can contribute to the greater cause. 
1 Corinthians 12, but now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. So you see how the Bible's telling us here that in a body there's many members, and every member in that body, every body part, plays a role. So what does that mean in Christianity? Everyone should have a ministry. Everyone should be doing something for God. So when you think in your life, like, what am I doing for God? You have to have an answer for that. What are you doing for God? You know, so what is your ministry? Like, there's many different things that to do in, the, in church, or do, even not even in church, just like something that well, you're contributing to the kingdom of God. But everyone should have a ministry, just like every body part has a purpose here. There's not a body part that doesn't have a purpose. And it's saying here, even so, nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Sometimes you don't realize how necessary a body part is until it stops working. That's the same with church members as well. You don't realize how critical they are until they're not there anymore. And so there's, there's something missing. So we serve with joy. We want to have a ministry. We want to have a mind of a servant to serve one another like Jesus Christ. But the value isn't just service, right? The value is to serve with joy, right? Because it's not just about serving, it's about having the right attitude in service as well. Psalm 102 is one of our memory verses. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. I was just telling my kids this morning what was Psalm 122.1, right? Because everyone wakes up for church, all grumpy. Psalm 122.1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, right? So having the right attitude, serve with gladness. 1 John 5.3, look at this. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Number five. Number five, Valley. So we've got seven in total. Number five is that we lead by example. Lead by example. We don't want to be like the Pharisees. Look at what, the Phar look at what Jesus says about the Pharisees here in Matthew 23. 3. All therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do ye not after their works, for they say and do not. So you don't want to be a parent like this either, where you tell your children to do something that you're not willing to do. You want to say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Right? So they're being hypocritical. They're telling, they're not leading by example. So you don't want to be like the Pharisee. You want to be what Paul is encouraging Timothy to do. 1 Timothy 4.12 Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying out of hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. So you see how, as he leads by example, and he lives the life, they're going to see the difference, right? That thy profiting may appear unto all. So when you lead by example, you want to be visible to other people. You want people to see how you live so you can be that example to other people. But if you're never around, if you never do things in the group, then people don't see you and see what you're like. Now we lead by example. One point I want to make here is everyone should be a leader. So you don't want to get the mindset that, oh, you know, well, I'm not a man. Maybe I'm not a leader. Or I'll never be in a leadership. Or I don't lead any ministries. I'm not a leader. Everyone should be leading by example. Everyone is a leader in one way or another. Because as you grow in your faith, as you mature in your faith, younger believers are going to look to you to see how you live your life. 
So you always want to strive to be a leader, even though you may not be a leader in an official capacity. You want to be a leader and an example to others within the church. And this is what Titus 2, I really feel, is the theme throughout here, as he's encouraging all the different age groups and genders within the church, right? And there's only two genders, right? So not all these genders. Titus 2.1, he's going through these different things of the, the two genders and uh, the age groups, but you'll see that it's about being a good example to others as well. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behaviour as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. Look, that they may teach the young women. So you see how it's the older is setting the example, they're leading by example to teach the younger women and men. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise, exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. And now this is talking to Titus. See, like you're being the example to the young men, and then, you know, everyone's being an example to other people. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. So you see how it works both ways. That not only should the leader be a good example, the master a good example, but the employee can be a good example as well to the master. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity. And look at this, look at this word that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in all things. See, when you think of doctrine, you tend to think of just the things you believe, the positions that you take, you know, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, I believe salvation by grace, once saved, always saved. But you see how like, it says you adorn the doctrine of God. So part of living the Christian life is being that good example, following the Word of God, living a godly life, that you may put it on so that people can see. But then if you don't look any different, if you don't behave any different, what are you adorning? You know, when you look and act exactly like the world. So we lead by example. Everyone a leader so that we can all lead by example, right? Don't just say what to do and don't do it yourself. Number six. Two more, two more. Number six. Always... Be growing. Always be growing. I think this is a great value that we want to strive for. Not only growing physically, like we talked about in the community, in the vision, you know, in numbers, being fruitful and multiplying, having children, right? But always growing spiritually as well. We don't want to stagnate in our faith. And God forbid we don't want to backslide. You know, you have the ebbs and flows of the Christian life where you grow and you backslide a bit, but you want, like I always say, you have the ebbs and flows, but you want to be trending upwards. Right? You want to always be growing. First Peter 2, always be growing. Wherefore, lay aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. So, so when we talk about growing, we don't want to just grow only in knowledge. Right? We're not only growing in the positive but as we grow we start to cut out the negative as well you see here so here he's talking about these newborn babes growing but it's not just about growing about understanding more and having more knowledge growing is also about cutting the sin out of your life becoming more graceful becoming more charitable having less malice right sort of like evil thoughts guile hypocrisies envies and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Another verse on growing is in Hebrews 5. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, so this is saying here, you're meant to have grown to the point where you have something to contribute, where you can teach other believers. Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk, 
and not of strong meat. So you see, the danger in the Christian life is if you're not growing, it's not that you just stay where you are, you start going backwards. You start becoming younger in the Christian faith till you're a baby again. You see, so we don't want to backslide. We need to always be growing. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So how do we grow? How are we always growing? Because we use the things that we learn. We use God's word. The more we use it, the more we grow. And oftentimes the reason why people stop growing or they start backsliding is because they stop using it. Right? They stop using the things that they learn. They stop implementing the things that they've learned and then they start going back and then they need somebody to teach them again whereas they should be at the point where they should be teaching others. Second Peter 3, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. So you see how part of growth is being wary of what's going to hinder you from growing, right? The worldliness, the sin, the error of the wicked, that you fall from your own steadfastness. You need to take heed lest ye fall, right? And this is the things you do in your life, maybe the people you hang around. You know, the people you're hanging around are being a bad influence on you. You need to be wary of that. That's going to hinder your growth for the Lord. 18, but growing grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Now the last one I wanted to touch on is, I think, a good value, is we want to fear God, not man. Fear God, not man. I want to read you this passage from Matthew 10, because this is talking about just persecution in general. It says here, Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So I think it's a good passage to talk about being bold in this world that we live in that is quite adversarial to the things of God. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. You see here that they're undergoing persecution. They're in the face of adversity, and they need to trust God to guide them. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. So not only do we have persecution and we need to be bold um, fear God not man just society wise where they might persecute us but sometimes the persecution comes from within you know from your family from your brothers and your parents you know maybe parents the children and cause them to be put to death and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake but he that endureth to the end shall be saved but when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another, for verily I say unto you, shall have not gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is not for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. So here's that boldness, right? That even in that face of adversity, they still speak up. And what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in him. So we have potential persecution from the world. But what I want to talk about what I want to talk about more, so Matthew 10 is talking about physical persecution, but we don't really experience much, much of that. Ours is a bit more subtle, isn't it, in the world that we live in today. It's not just the physical persecution, but where I would like our church to fear God and not man is just in the conformity to this world, you know, because you don't want to stick out, because you don't want to be different. 
you know, that you try to conform to this world so you fit in. And what I want to encourage you today and what I think about when I think about fearing God and not man, because we don't really take beatings, get thrown in prison, you know, maybe the last three years you went protesting, but nowadays we're just preaching the gospel and things like that. I mean, there's not really that sort of persecution. You know, maybe, you know, is it Satan that's, you know, playing things a bit wiser? Now it's just Christians just being ashamed of being a Christian, being an overt Christian. You know, they want to talk like the world, they want to dress like the world, they want to act like the world, they want to have the same interests as the world, they just want to blend in. But no, we should fear God, not man. We should not be, we should not be worried about telling people we go to church on Sundays. We've all been there, you know, we've all been there where, you know, at first things are different, things are new, you're a little ashamed of doing something different. I want to encourage you, you shouldn't be. Don't be ashamed of the Lord and his word. Don't be ashamed of who we are. Sometimes people are ashamed of being a Christian because they, can't, they don't really know why they believe things. They, they can't really defend what they believe. So you know, I find it's the same in, in, in fighting, like in jiu-jitsu. And, and there's, a, there's a really famous jiu-jitsu instructor called John Danaher, you might not know him super technical guy, but he has some very good philosophical thoughts when it comes to jiu-jitsu, and I find they apply when it comes to spirituality too, because th this is why the fighting analogy fits so well with Christianity, because a lot of the analogies fit. But he was saying that, you know, in, in jiu-jitsu, somebody's confidence at attacking in jiu-jitsu, that makes sense, is because in jiu-jitsu you may do a certain attack and put yourself in a worse position. But if you know how to defend and get yourself out of that bad position, you are more likely to try for that attack. And I just think that applies very similar in Christianity, where you may not be so willing to go on the offensive in Christianity, be so bold in your Christianity. Why? Because you're not so good at defending what you believe. But when you get very good, you know the word, you're very good at defending what you believe, you can have that conversation boldly, then you don't mind so much Telling people, hey, I go to church, I do this, yeah, I go. Because you know it's the right thing, you know it's the truth, you know, because, and it's, it's hard for me to explain, but because uh, I'm just sort of going on the fly here, but that, that idea of boldness comes from an increase of knowledge. It's not just, just be bold and just be bold, a zeal without knowledge. No, when you have the knowledge, then you have the right type of zeal, and you'll find yourself being more bold because you know more and it's just like in fighting you're not going to go out and start a fight when you don't know how to fight but if you know how to fight then you're more likely to stand up for yourself when that fight occurs so look at what romans 12 says i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto god which is your reasonable service and look at this and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I think back to when, see, when you, because when you grow up as a Christian, you don't really go through this, right? That's why, I'm, and it's a, it's a blessing in a way, but you know, sometimes people that grow up in Christian families have to understand the, the change, you know? So when you grow up in a Christian family, you know, you grow up reading the Bible, you grow up going to church on Sunday, you know, um, you grow up going to Christian events and prioritizing Christian events, listening to Christian music, dressing, you know, modestly. But when you come from non-Christian family or unbelieving family or a worldly family and you're trying to lift your standards, there's that awkwardness in the change. That's what we talk about, right? Like some of you ladies say to me, oh, I don't feel like putting on a dress. I'm not used to wearing a dress. Or like, you know, getting up on Sunday mornings or maybe like, you know, the guys are going out on Friday night and then we've got a church event or something like that. And it's, it's a change in lifestyle. You know, maybe, you know, you, 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 you listen to the Christian music, but then when your mates get into the car, maybe you mute the Christian music, you know, because it's like, you're, not, you're just not so bold in your Christianity. That's what I'm saying. Fear God, not man. 
I'm not saying you have to wear the Jesus loves you t-shirt. You may, you may get to that point. But, you know, it's like if you're wearing the church t-shirt, does it matter if people know that you go to church, that you love God, that you're passionate about the things of God? They'll probably respect your witness a bit more if they knew you were more serious about the things of God. So, it's not only persecution. It's conformity to the world because you don't want to stick out. You know, like when you change music, change in dress, change in your appearance. You know, especially with the ladies, you say like, you know, your friends say, oh, how come you, you dress like a dag? Are you dressed like a dag? Or are you trying to be more modest? Hey, maybe because you say, hey, because I'm trying to be more modest. I don't want just to encourage this society of fornication and society of things. So I'm trying to do something about it. You know, that's what I'm saying. Like, you'll be more bold in what you do when you know why you do things. You know, um, what else? Same, same thing. Ah, that's, this is the one I wanted to touch on. Because the one that, the one that I find is, is sad, sad. It's like, you know, we want to go out, we want to preach the gospel, door to door, or even in the highways. But sometimes I, sometimes I hear people say, yeah, but what if somebody sees me? I don't want to go soul winning in that neighborhood because people know me there. This is what I'm talking about, right? Nobody's beating you up. Nobody's throwing you in jail. You're just ashamed of being a Bible-believing Christian that is passionate about the Great Commission. So we need to fear God, not man. And like I talked about with the transgender movement, it's like with false religion. It amazes me how bold they are. I mean, how bold are the Muslims? The Muslims will wear their scarf, you know, they go around, they'll go, you know, at work, get their mat, you know, do their prayers five times a day. Do you think they care what people think? They don't care what people think and they don't even have the truth. But we have the truth. Why do we care what people think? We need to be more bold. We need to fear God, not man. Galatians 1.10 For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So in conclusion, there's our the valleys I'm thinking about. I don't, not necessarily in stone, but I think if we follow these values, this would set an extremely good godly culture in our church. Love the Lord. We have a burden for the lost. Work diligently. Serve with joy. Lead by example. Always be growing. Fear God, not man. I'm not saying I've arrived here either. So I think this is a good reminder for me too. This is what I'd like us to strive for. I think if we strive for this, we're going to fulfill the mission and fulfill our vision. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for, thank you for the example that you set for us. Such a an example of perfection, something that we can't reach without your grace, Lord. So we just ask you, Lord, fill us with your grace. Give us boldness. Give us strength. Give us wisdom. Help us to not be ashamed of who we are, what we believe, and what we, how we, who we are. So we thank you, Lord, and uh, we just pray that everything that we do and say in our lives brings glory to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.